in no uncertain terms, this book completely changed my life reading it. You know, I, I know that I remember hearing a quote one time, I think it was from a lecturer at uni who said, you'll be lucky, you know, in, in your life if you come across five books that truly changed who you are as a person. And I, I feel like this is certainly one of those uh, and nothing, nothing else really comes close to it. Hello and welcome to The Books That Made Me, a brand new podcast from Rebel Book Club. Today we are meeting Kieran Thapper, who is the author of Cut Short, Why We're Failing Our Youth and How to Fix It. Kieran is a writer, youth worker and education consultant based in London. And we actually met Kieran at another Rebel Book Club event where we were talking about grime culture. And he has great insight on what is going on in our cities uh, with youth culture and the problems that surround it and how we can solve some of these things. And his choices of the books that have shaped and made him as a human, as a writer, absolutely fascinating. Enjoy this conversation. Great to reconnect again after chatting to you a couple of years ago when we were reading Stormzy's book, Rise Up. and. Um, for those of us that met you then, got to know you as a, a youth worker, an education consultant, teacher of, about how to you know, write for social impact and, and a journalist in many different ways. But since then, you've published your debut nonfiction book, Cut Short, a true story spanning five years about young life and youth violence in South London. Um, and the paperback is about to kick off and it's probably out there whilst you're listening to this podcast. Um, Annie Mack, who we enjoyed uh, listening to the other day, chatting with you, said it's the most important book a Londoner could read this year, which is high praise. Uh, so for those that haven't come across you and your book, Kieran, tell us a little bit about uh, Cut Short and uh, the impact it's having so far. Sure. Um, again, yeah, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So I wrote Cut Short off the back of a five-year period in which I became a youth worker in South London. I worked in schools, prisons, youth services, various charities. I also wrote journalism alongside those roles and tried to sort of document what I was doing on the ground with, in terms of my work with young people in different spaces, but also some of the sort of social problems I was identifying. And I guess the good work being done by lots of different people across London to try and solve those problems and cut short is the culmination of of like realizing and kind of identifying a lot of the problems going wrong um in particular systemically that affect young people um and then yeah trying to capture a lot of the, the solutions as well so it's a sort of uh a book about my experiences it's a memoir but it's also a book that tries to tell a story that's compelling and teaches the reader about problems and solutions. And, and tell us maybe about one of the stories in the book, because obviously you, you zoom in on a few different uh, stories, but one that, um, that sort of stands out at the moment in your mind. It's a story that spans five years. I guess you could call me one of the main characters. And then there are uh, four other characters uh, there are lots of different people in the book who are sort of interviewed, who feature in it in its pages. But there are four um, men who are kind of my journey alongside them is, I guess, the, the spine of the book in terms of its narrative. Um, there is Carl, Dimitri and Jamal, who are three young men that I worked with. They go from being ages 12, 13 and 14 to being 18, 19 and 20 in the book. So they grow up essentially through um from childhood to you know adulthood uh and then there's tony who runs he's like a mentor to myself and he runs a community center in brixton where i sort of um i'm, sh I'm shown the ropes of youth work and where i meet a couple of the characters um to pick one of them i guess jamar is probably probably the main uh most celebrated character in the book in terms of uh both his personal journey throughout the book. He's the first young person I started working with as a volunteer that then led me to sort of become passionate about working in education. I met him when he was 12. He's now 20 years old. And the book um, concludes with him as an 18 year old, sort of standing up on stage triumphantly, starting to rap and, and talk about his journey. But halfway through the book, he loses his older brother, Michael, to a stabbing. And so the book sort of follows his journey growing up, navigating South London at school and coming across challenges, but ultimately overcoming them, which I guess is 
in my view, probably the most triumphant part of the whole book, which is yeah, Jamal's sort of thread. But all three characters, all three young men, uh, are doing brilliantly, and, and their stories feature throughout. It's brilliant, and and this sort of uh, skill of um, using human stories to tell the bigger picture, as well as all the statistics and data and everything, is something we know. In our community really hooks in readers. Um, where where did this sort of writing journey come from for you? What what led you to becoming um, you know, an expert in, in telling stories for change? It's difficult to, I guess, identify where it began, but if I had to pick a moment, it was, I mean, just as a, as a becoming a writer and identifying as a writer and thinking that that was something that I wanted to do to express myself. When I was at university, when I was about 20, at 19, 20, I started writing a diary to sort of cope with my mental health. And that turned into a bit of an addiction where I would just spill my thoughts onto the page. And that, that then kind of went into a blog and then the blog went into writing a few bits of journalism and then it kind of took off from there. Um, but it basically meant that when I became a youth worker, you know, I was noticing all these different things happening. And then I would go home at the end of the day and write in my diary about injustice, about things I was noticing. And I guess that having that space to process everything um, was really important. And it, yeah, it kind of all came from that practice, that, that personal practice that I had. I never really intended to be a writer per se or an author, but I guess it just happened because I was passionate about it. And since that period, I've tried to be really focused about um, not just journalism or writing or um, being an author, but really trying to marry the impact I'm having on the ground in my youth work, my education work with with the writing. So that's why I'm sort of teaching a lot of writing now. Kind of that's the ultimate goal is to empower young people to be able to tell their own stories and uh, charities to be able to communicate them, their impact better. Um, so yeah, I kind of it's a marriage of lots of different things, but it's ultimately I see my impact on the ground as a youth worker is kind of quite similar to my writing impact. Yeah, and and it's it's interesting to hear you talk about how you how it became an important habit for your own mental health early on in your life, but also, you know, now using it as a, a, a as a powerful weapon to change society and inspire others. Um, so so switching from the habit of writing to reading, uh, we've asked you to choose uh, or pick out three from what I imagine is a big pile of of non-fiction books that have shaped you as a person. So um, perhaps you can tell us about the first book that you've listed that, um, that had a big impact on you when you read it and, and what, what changed as a result of reading the book. Sure. So um, the book I'm going to start with, which is probably the most formative in terms of both chronology, because I read it when I was like 21, 22. And I think it, it accompanied my practice of starting to write a diary back then really well was The Hero of a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. Um, and in no uncertain terms, this book completely changed my life reading it. You know, I, I know that I remember hearing a quote one time, I think it was from a lecturer at uni who said, you'll be lucky, you know, in, in your life if you come across five books that truly changed who you are as a person. And I, I feel like, this is certainly one of those uh, and nothing, nothing else really comes close to it. But, and the reason for that is there's, I mean, I could talk about it for hours, but I think the fundamental is that it, it was a book that helped me understand stories and, and uh, kind of study stories in a really interesting way um, intellectually, but it also kind of doubles up as a way of understanding life and, and, and what humans want from life. And I just found it, instead of just reading a self a self help book or reading like a more explicit non fiction book that might like tell you certain philosophical ideas explicitly i think the way that joseph campbell weaves together all these different um pieces of research mythology stories from across the world at different times in human history and like ultimately presents this model that he calls the hero's journey i find it very persuasive and actually helpful for myself for the person it's brilliant that you, it, you sort of came across it at that stage in your, you know, relatively young in your life and, and also how it shaped you. For me, it's, uh, I sort of dipped in and out of it over the years and keep coming back to it, like, like in conversations like this. And it sort of reminds me of the fact, you know, it's as powerful on sort of the understanding of, as you say, human nature and, and what makes us 
as a species is like reading, you know, all the Shakespeare plays combined. And at the same time, it's like a handbook for action and storytelling, right? So it's, it's sort of a double whammy. What's, uh, so what happened once you read it? What did it, what did it really help you with? And for those that, those that have like, have never heard of a hero with a thousand faces, tell us that sort of the basic principles of the book. Sure. So J- Joseph Campbell was a comparative mythologist. Um, and the Hero of a Thousand Faces is considered to be his like magnum opus. Is considered to be um, his his most defining work that he wrote. I believe the the year is nineteen forty nine, or with give or yeah. take a year. Um, and so the book is a kind of reflection of its times as well. I think it, it um, you know, I'm sure there will be lots of updates where he to, where he to be alive in twenty twenty two. But it's he'd spent a whole career traveling around the world um, studying. Uh, tribal rituals, religions, mythologies, um, like rites of passage, um, and he compiled all these different findings and realizations together into this book, which um, kind of pivots around this concept of the hero's journey. And the hero's journey is this cycle that um, the hero of a story goes through, uh, where they go through a number of stages that Joseph Campbell outlines in the book. Um, And he essentially presents that as the fundamental structure of stories that humans have created over millennia as a way of, basically as a way of surviving, actually. It kind of presents storytelling as a model of survival. So we Mm. tell stories to survive. It's what separates us from the others, right? It's the ability to communicate beyond that group round the fire isn't it and tell those stories and they get passed on through myths and legend yeah exactly exactly um so that's kind of what it's about the gist of it um and yeah it, it really just it really just i think i was in a you know you go through these periods in life where you are more receptive to new ideas maybe and i, and I think at the time i was really searching for uh, structure. I was searching for some meaning in, you know, trying to think about what I wanted to do in my career. And when I read it, it yeah, it just really clicked, and you start to realise actually that it's it it helped me to realise that stories are absolutely everywhere. Like we experience hundreds of them a day, uh, whether we realise it or not. Um, and if not stories, then sort of like different symbolic experiences that actually do mean something, and and. And it empowered me to think about how I could create better structures in my own life to, yeah, start living more meaningfully and um, and be more fulfilled. And I think one of those things was to sort of take seriously the idea of becoming a writer myself. So I guess it had that, it spurred me on in lots of ways. It's so interesting because a lot of times I hear people talk about this book, it's often around, oh yeah, now I understand how, you know, Star Wars was written or Lord of the Rings. And it's always around that kind of strategy for creating you know great fiction and art and we've seen it in pixar and marvel executed brilliantly haven't we in all other sort of famous stories but the fact for you it, it was all, almost like a therapy or a, a way of lighting up a path for your own uh career and personal development as well is is really fascinating to hear and and do you do you still use it as a reference um for the, the storytelling and teaching that you're doing now yeah um definitely i mean i use it i used it as a reference for cut short cut short if you go through if you're a student of joseph campbell and you go through cut short you will be able to identify lots of different stages of the hero's journey it was just a way for me to make sense of uh, a very challenging intense period of my life but also tell it in a way that i thought would be compelling um so cut short itself um and lots of my writing my long-form journalism and profiles i've written often will rely upon the basic structures of uh, yeah the hero the hero's journey um so that's on the writing side but yeah on the teaching now i i'm explicitly trying to weave it into um workshops i run with young people um i taught so i teach i've just started teaching um a course I've designed for City University for their short course um, set up called Writing for Social Impact. And I use various storytelling models to try and get the participants of the workshops thinking about ways that they can express themselves clearly and with a structured sort of impactful form and 
uh, yeah, I refer to it there as well. So it's, it's, it's very much active in my life every single day, both as a writer and as a teacher. Um, yeah, I think about it all the time. It's a big, uh, yeah, it's a big... Just, I also think about it when I like, you know, you, you, you pick up on it when you watch certain films and, you know, you, you see it everywhere. So it's like, a, it can, it, once you, I feel like it's one of those things that once you read, you can't unsee it, you know, it's like... Yeah, 100%. So it turns out you don't just need to be a published author to have had books change your life. We see this happen every month at Rebel Book Club. And we're also seeing our members' reading habits shift as well towards listening to more books to fit around their busy digital lives on the move. So when we found out about a new audiobook service called ZigZag, we were excited to give it a spin. ZigZag's aim is to make reading easier and more accessible, engaging and sustainable, so even more curious minds can enjoy great books. And with their subscription-free library of awesome books on the award-winning ZigZag app, which get cheaper every five books you read, you're getting great value as you build your audiobook stack. What's really cool is they've created something called an X-Book, an audiobook and ebook in one format, exclusive to ZigZag on certain books. And the really exciting part for us is that people join Rebel Book Club in 2023 get a free audiobook on ZigZag to kickstart their non-fiction reading journey with us. The link to this fab offer is on the pod page and rebelbook.club. The future of reading is multi-format and we're pumped to be teaming up with a brilliant indie audiobook startup. Now, talking of books that change lives... So it, it's a big first book, Kieran, to, to sort of say this is the book that's uh, out of the three. What are you going to follow it up with? What's your second book? So the second book um, is The Corner by David Simon, which is, I've got, I've got the books here, the, well, the first two. Uh, it's a big, chunky one, and actually holding it and seeing how chunky it is now, um, <laughs> when I read it, it yeah, it, it, was, it was a big, chunky book to get completely immersed in. Um, David Simon and Ed Burns are the writers of it. David Simon is kind of considered the, the main uh, the main man behind it, but they're also the people that created The Wire, the television series, which is you know like lots of people's my favourite, um, and was a really again another really defining um, story to experience. So having watched the show several times all the way through, um, I then read this book the corner and actually I had quite like limited expectation at the start of reading it of like how much more can this actually show me you know he's he's done this amazing job of creating a wire subsequent to this book um the book was written first how much can this show me and actually it, it was a really good it's really testament to the power of books compared to television because you do just get a completely different take on it you know I think you get you get uh in particular what stands out like the 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 way that he gets in the minds of the characters and really you really hear their internal dialogues and, and they're all very different characters, like all coming from different walks of life and different places, all centering around this one corner in Baltimore. Um, just stylistically as well, I think it really inspired me. It, it was really influential on the way I wrote Cut Short because it's basically like an interplay between this pulling, like zooming in on these super detailed um, micro interactions between different members of the community and what they're thinking and feeling, and then zooming all the way out and sort of making, you know, yes, essentially being a social commentator about American um, society. So using that interplay between the micro and the macro, he, I think he did it amazingly. Yeah, it just stayed with me a lot. It stayed with me a lot reading that. So that's the second book. With the context of uh, Cut Short, it makes so much sense why why this book played a big part in your life. And obviously, it was written quite a while ago in the late nineties, I think. But what? How much of it was the um, w was the way that it was put together as a story about that about that uh, community in Baltimore versus what was going on, the actual context of the of the life there, and the comparison with what you were experiencing in London, or was it a mix of the two? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's definitely a mix of the two. Stylistically, you know, what I was saying just now about the macro and micro, um, that what I found is that, and, and I applied this, again, stylistically to Cut Short, is that if you present a really compelling, moving, emotionally drawing story, then you can sort of hook the reader onto your journey. And 
guide the reader through this very this story that they have to know what's happened happens next because they care so much about the characters and they care so much about like this narrative taking place but obviously as you go on the journey you can then break off into little bits of statistics and research and sociology and and because the readers so, like you know i, I was well meaning and in, in, you know a, a young curious reader when i read the book um and i feel like you know i was interested in all the statistics as well but but without a doubt you get through parts of the book because you're so dying to find out what happens next and therefore you it's much easier to process and contextualize those stats and those things that he's te- he tells you about the war and drugs about policing about like the experience of, of racism in communities like a lot of the analysis that he that david simon and ed burns put into the corner i feel like is easy to gather for the reader because you're so into the story. And that stylistically is a thing I try to apply to Cut Short in every sentence I wrote. Um, you know, you, as you read Cut Short, you, you I hope, are immersed and, and you care about these young men who are navigating this really difficult world um, that is often just invisible to most people. But then as, as I go writing the book, you, you know, I break away into my own analysis as a youth worker, but also interviews with other experts as well. So that style was was a main thing and then without a doubt yeah you know just the idea of like i guess social commentary in the city that as a general headline for both books there's there's obviously a lot of comparison um but london's very different to baltimore i guess so that's also worth saying yeah which is why we need cut short and your mission um have you ever connected with the authors or the community around the wire and and the corner I haven't, but would love to uh would love to get a copy to david simon um in particular uh, i don't really know i think like i've put a minimal amount of effort into like make like, i gave up basically because i was like how am i supposed to get hold of this guy but i think at one point in my career like that's the kind of bucket, bucket list idea is try and get him a copy of cut short at some point over the coming years i don't know how i go about doing that but I'll uh, david that. and edward if you subscribe to the uh, rebel book club podcast <laughs> let us know yeah, we'll, we'll connect you but it's really it's really ref- it's such a good reminder to us that the sort of approach especially the style as well as the context to like non-fiction writing we talk about it a lot like creative non-fiction and we know in our in our community the books that are story driven human story first um, and then society context data uh tools for change etc second or or built on the top of it are more more impactful um um, rather than pure, pure sort of data-driven academic stuff. So it's an obvious lesson, but it's a good reminder to authors and, and readers out there what works. So thank you for introducing The Corner to us. And then and then your third book, Kieran, what are you going for? So the third book I don't have here, um, which in itself is a commentary on my interest in it, <laughs> which is the fact that I've lent it out to family members. And it's Partition Voices by Kavita Puri. Um, and that is a book I read actually in 2020, late 2020, when I'd finished Cut Short and I was seeking just a sort of uh, a new direction of reading. But also I was just personally interested in trying to read more on the partition of India. I'm half Indian. My dad's Punjabi. And my grandparents and my yeah, my dad and his brothers moved to London and settled in South Hall in West London in the sixties, like many Punjabis did. Um, and uh, this is another thing I can talk about for hours. But essentially, the headline is that there is a lot of Punjabis, there's a lot of Indians who, uh, especially in the diaspora, who have not had access to the conversations that we should have had access to about actually what happened during partition and independence um and so i was going through this period of yeah like thinking on my my next book thinking on what i could turn my attention to in terms of my writing also yeah just trying to understand a bit of personal history and and family history um and so i turned to partition voices by kavita puri and uh it it has shaped my life ever since if i'm completely honest behind the scenes i've been yes i read that book it was it was it was like talking to my my late grandparents who I never got to talk to about partition. They passed when I was younger and I was too young to sort of have any context for that. And it was kind of like having a conversation with them. You know, there's lots of elderly people that Kavita interviews and gets their experiences of what it was like. 
And it sparked off this two year journey now. I, well, I was, you know, a uh, 20 month journey, however long. Um, and now I'm sat here with another book proposal nearly, you know, nearly ready, which is uh, about the about the legacy of partition in London. And so that's that sort of, yeah, it's defined a lot of my writing life since then. And I'm really grateful to Kavita for that. Wow, it really has. And talk about books having an impact. This one is, is huge for you. And um, for, the, for those that maybe don't have the same uh, story or background as you, what's, what, why does this book matter to, to, to people beyond that community? Good question. So, yeah, I would, I'd honestly encourage anyone to read it. But I think that there's a particular... I'm going to say responsibility, actually, if you're a, you know, a curious person that enjoys nonfiction books and you live in Britain, you live in the UK, reading Partition Voices, and there are, there are other books like it that will give you similar sort of uh, access to this history. But we were not, I certainly wasn't, most people were not told or taught anything about Partition, the you know, Indian independence beyond that maybe that there was a you know this big independence movement for several decades that was led by Mahatma Gandhi and then it was successful and it was all fun and games after that. Um, that's the kind of narrative that's that people maybe have on a simple level, but uh, really understanding the sheer scale of what happened and there were lots of different reasons for it being as bloody and as tragic as it ended up being. You know, estimated one to two million people died. Over 10 million people displaced. It's considered one of the biggest displacement of people in the shortest amount of time in human history. It's never happened on that scale. Um, a massive, massive contributor to what happened was the, the British elite and decision-making taking place in, in Westminster and in, in Buckingham Palace even. You know, this was, this was still a time when the UK's... Um, colonial presence around the world was disintegrating but still super influential and they were you know all the decisions being made of how to sort of hold on to India in the, in the build up to independence in 1947 that was a very very uh, a time that is super important that is barely recognised now in history books uh, in terms of school in terms of just mainstream storytelling and so I would just encourage people to yeah to read it as an access point into, into that period um, and actually it's contributed in so many ways to the way that British life is now, not just in terms of the presence of, of Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis in, in the UK, but also our language, our food, our, like so many different things, and both here and also understanding some of the context between the madness, of the madness going on in India right now, you know, understanding religious over there, it's important for that too. So it's just, it's, it's an accent. I feel like it's a good gateway into understanding quite a vast subject you know it's 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 a good it fills in certain certain historical um what i think is 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 lacking from historical storytelling mostly yeah and when you've got people like mainstream media journalists like jeremy vine saying it changed the way i see the world you, you can see how accessible it is and i guess it's part of this um new wave of non-fiction that we're seeing like um you know satnam sangera's empire land it's, and, and others that are helping decolonize uh, you know, history, British history, a little bit, and hopefully moving into the curriculum uh, for the for the next generation. I'm I'm curious, Kieran, as we come to the end of this uh, this conversation about how you manage. Uh, you come across as a sort of obviously hyper curious uh, and and sort of mission driven person, but how do you stay calm as as you discover these stories? Um, both on the streets of, of London um, that are so painful and, and so unfair, but also in recent history in your own uh, cultural heritage through stories like Pit Partition Voices. How do, you, how do you manage all that pain and anger and, and use it as such a positive force? That's a good question. I don't think I've been asked that before. Um, well, I think, I think I always feel a responsibility to say, I don't always stay calm. <laughs> and just being honest about it's not been easy, you know, writing a book like Cut Short in particular, I, I feel like I've just about recovered from it, you know, in terms of the, what it took out of me. I'm very proud of it. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I guess if not staying calm, I, 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 getting through it and, and feeling a sense of completion and peace now that I do and, you know, having pride over the fact that it came out last year, but 
having a general interest in in injustice and retaining that and staying true to that i think it's i think it's just having a healthy balance of everything really and seeing seeing the higher purpose of it um so on the balance side of things you know always making sure that i treat my writing kind of now like i did when i first picked up the pen to write my diary when i was 20 you know it's it's like it's a therapy and and honoring that and treating that with that respect and having that safe space to really like open up and and do that and having good editors you know good other writers to talk to about that like treating that as a genuine like life practice that I, I kind of uphold every day um that's just that's just one thing i try and do um and the sort of seeing the higher purpose of things as well i, I think now with cut short i'm starting to see it ripping out into society i'm starting to going to schools and prisons and delivering workshops on it and hearing other youth workers and other teachers who have read it and, and found it useful to spark conversations in their own work and make them think about new ways of doing things and whatever. Like actually seeing the, that impact of write, that writing can have, that's what keeps me going. It's, it's so, there's nothing more fulfilling than that to me. So I guess that's another way of, if not staying calm, certainly staying level-headed and like this is actually very important, so I need to keep going. Oh, it's such a great reminder to, to us um and and it's great to hear kieran that there's another book in the work so focusing on the legacy of partition partition of india in Lo in london in the culture and the city of london so what's the timeline on that how's it all going uh, there's still a lots and lots to go um and even that you know little little tagline that i've just given you is likely to sort of alter a bit but um it's essentially i'm completing the proposal now i'm aiming to I'm aiming to basically submit that proposal and get some sort of, you know, arrangement for me writing a book within the next year. Six months is a, is probably the ideal, but might be unrealistic. Um, and yeah, part of that is the challenge is trying to take something that is so epic and massive and spans, you know, nearly a century uh, and try and tell that in a compelling way that roots it in my family history, in in something that is spilling out across the world. Like there's there's stories all across the world of what happened in partition. Um, but how how does that manifest in London? Uh, how can I be how can I be true to the story uh, and the complexity of it, but also still honour the fact that you know I'm half white British and that that's an important aspect of of the story and. How do I make sense of that? So it's just, there's just a lot to unpack, basically. So if, I reckon about six months, I'll be ready. But yeah, excited. I'm mean, really excited. To... Well, I think with uh, I think with your you know going back to hero with a thousand faces, with that practice template, and of course your first round with cut short and the stories that you told with that, I'm sure you'll get nail it with your own personal start with your family story and spill out from there. And um, it's exciting to hear. Um, but yeah, for those who are uh, discovering Kieran's work uh, um, for the first time listen to this um go out and grab a copy of cut short why we're failing our youth and how to fix it um i've just ordered while we've been talking partition voices because it sounds like such a brilliant uh piece of of history storytelling that that i don't know enough about so thank you for introducing me to that kieran and thanks for sharing the books that have shaped you as a person so far they were brilliant choices and um yeah, good luck with the, the paperback launch. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Um, and yeah, enjoy, enjoy all the reading that is to come. <laughs> Brilliant. Cheers, Garrett. See you soon.